Welcome to the second last slot of CPP North 2022. Um, super excited to be back in an in-person conference after, what has it been, two and a half years or something? Um, my name is Connor Hoekstra, and today I'm going to be presenting uh, my talk, The Twin Algorithms. A um, couple things about me. This is my About Me slide. So I've been in industry since 2014, closing in on a decade now. I've worked at a couple different companies. Most recently, I've been working at NVIDIA for the last two and a half years. Um, throughout that time, uh, I've always been primarily a C++ developer. When I was at Amazon, I used a few other languages. And at NVIDIA, sometimes I dabble in a bit of Python. But primarily, I've been developing in C++ 11, 14, 7, or 17. Um, along the way, though, I started learning other languages. So at Amazon, there was a functional programming sort of lunch group where there were six or seven of us. And uh, we started learning Haskell. And at that point, Haskell became my favorite language. And uh, for a number of reasons, which we're going to get into in this talk, um, over the last two years, just over two years, uh, I've been studying array languages, um, APL specifically, but a few others. Um, and on top of this, I have a YouTube channel that's been going on for a few years uh, with programming-related things. I've been on Twitter for a few years. Um, during the pandemic, I started a programming languages virtual meetup where we work through programming language textbooks. So the first one we did was structure interpretation of computer programs. We moved on to category theory for programmers. And most recently, we finished Bruce Tate's uh, Seven Languages in Seven Weeks. Um, I also have two different podcasts. The first one is with a good friend of mine, Bryce Lelbach, who also works at NVIDIA called ADSP, Sean Parent, and uh, you know a few other people have uh, been guests on it. And uh, more recently, just over a year ago, uh, I joined a podcast or st helped start a podcast called ArrayCast that focuses on array languages like APL, J, BQN, et cetera. Um, but let's hop into the talk now. So I gave a lightning talk that I just posted to YouTube because in-person conferences were a thing that I would have given at C++ now uh, 2020 if that conference hadn't been canceled. And it was called the STL Algorithm Cheat Sheet, which was a sort of composition or highlighting the things that I talked about in two previous talks I had given, algorithm intuition and better algorithm intuition. So from the uh, algorithm intuition talk, everything highlighted in green um, is sort of comes from that talk. Everything highlighted in yellow is from my better algorithm intuition talk. And if you look down at the bottom, there's a small section that says the twin algorithms. And if you look closely, it says to be announced at a future conference. Um, that was going to be C++ now uh, 2020. But unfortunately, that conference got canceled. So uh, I'm giving that talk now today because I refuse to give that talk online because it is a talk I wanted to give in person. So we are now uh, finishing what I'm calling the algorithm intuition trilogy with uh, the twin algorithms talk. And uh, to prove that I was going to give this you know, two years ago, here's a tweet from all the way back in January 2020 where I was submitting this talk. And I was super, super excited about this talk, but have waited over two and a half years now to give this talk. So that's just setting up how, I am excited, how excited I am uh, to finally be giving this talk. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's hop into the twin algorithms. Right off the bat, <laughs> there's going to be quite a bit of APL in this talk. This is kind of secretly a 50% APL, 50% uh, C++ talk. Uh, why? Well, here's a compelling quote. Here's a compelling quote. Here's a compelling quote. Here's a compelling quote. Here's another compelling quote. If you're watching this on YouTube, which none of you in this room are, feel free to pause the video and go and read those compelling quotes. I don't have time to go through them right now. And I'm sort of breaking my rule of putting walls of text on the screen. but. Uh, when I came across these quotes, they got me even, even, even more excited about APL as I was learning it. Um, the last sentence of this quote from uh, a Vector article called APL, A Glimpse of Heaven, says, uh, you will only convince those who are willing to learn. Um, this talk is not trying to convince you to learn APL. There's going to be a lot of APL in this talk, but my goal at the end of this talk is not for all of you to convert to APL. Uh, I do have goals. I am trying to convince you of something. Maybe try and pick up on what that is, and I'll reveal that at the end of the talk. But don't think that I'm trying to convert people to APL. I don't even develop an APL. I write C++ day to day. I just study this language on my free time. So what is this talk about? This talk is about a plethora of things. It's about history. It's about APL. It's about C++ 11, 14, 17, 20, 23, even some features that aren't in the standards yet that hopefully we'll get in, but I'm just showing them anyways because I'm really excited about them. It's about Alexander Stepanov, Sean Parent a little bit, Arthur Whitney, Bill Gates, Harry Potter. Um, definitely, it's about IOTA. We, we all love IOTA. Um, and uh, more importantly, this is like 100% passion. This is stuff that like I think about when I'm running, when I'm you know, sleeping, anytime. You know, I, I have free cycles. I'm thinking about this stuff and super excited to be you know, sharing 
everything that I've learned basically over the last two and a half years while studying these uh, languages and this paradigm. So how did this happen? How did I get to this point today? How did a C++ developer fall in love with APL? In order to answer that question, we need to go back to 2010. And uh, I'm gonna take you from 2010 to now basically of how I'm standing in front of you. So in 2010, I was in university, second year, and I took a course called ACMA 320. It was an actuarial mathematics course, insurance statistics, mathy, very boring. But I had uh, one of the best professors I've ever had in my life. So this is my transcript. I did okay in the course. But uh, Dr. Gary P Parker, if he's watching this somehow, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Gary Parker. You're one of the best professors, if not the best professor I've ever had in my life. Um, and he said at one point in this class that back in the day, actuaries used to use this language, this mythical language called APL. And, but people stopped using it because it was kind of hard to read and you know, had a lot of trade-offs. Uh, you know, very, very efficient when writing with it, but developed a lot of legacy. Um, then uh, a couple years later, um, my older sister is an engineer, and she mentioned that she was using this software product called Metsim and uh, said, oh, they use this god-awful language called APL in order to program it. And I was like, oh, that's odd. I've, I've heard about this language. You know, my professor, Dr. Gary Parker, mentioned it. Then, very curiously, my younger sister, I've got three sisters, another sister works at a hedge fund and mentions she's using this programming language called Q in a database called KDB+. And I'm like, that's odd. I've never heard of Q. Like, I know quite a few programming languages. I look up Q. Q is a descendant of K, which is a descendant of APL. And so now two of my sisters are doing something APL adjacent. And so this, this is just building up this sort of you know, stack of times I've heard APL. The next time is uh, when I make a YouTube video in 2018 on my YouTube channel that is on partial sum and IOTA. And I mentioned, because I was doing research, that IOTA actually comes from a language called APL. Um, that sort of exploded in six months later when Sean Parent uh, basically ended up responding to someone on Twitter who uh, had made some comment about IOTA being this, you know, oh, look how smart I am. And then it turned into this whole hashtag on Twitter called IOTA shaming, uh, which you can go watch my CVPCon 2019 talk where that sort of slide that's been copied here, that's taken from that talk. Um, and then this all sort of comes to a head in uh, 2019 when I was uh, listening to Functional Geekery. So uh, I'm also gonna tell you how I started listening to Functional Geekery because I think it's an interesting story. Um, some individual that I don't know named Paul uh, tweeted back in 2018. And uh, he's tweeted, uh, I feel like I'm cheating on CPPCast with a podcast called LambdaCast. And uh, then on CPPCast, episode 162, that's how I heard about this tweet. And I'm gonna play an audio clip. Hopefully it's be audible. Well, at the top of our episode, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, this week we got a tweet from Paul saying, I feel like I'm cheating on CVP cast with Lambda cast, but it is so good. So uh, ooh, rest in peace to uh, CVP cast. Hopefully they'll come back at one point. But if you don't listen to CVP cast, they have, I think, 300 roughly episodes uh, on the backlog that you can go and watch. It's an awesome podcast. So I heard this on the podcast. And so the next thing you have to go and do is uh, basically uh, listen to all the LambdaCast episodes. And uh, that podcast is absolutely amazing. There's only 20 of them, functional programming, uh, super, super high quality. Uh, I listened to all of them, loved it so much that I searched the host of the podcast on my podcast app, his name's David Kunst, and found him on another podcast, Functional Geekery. So then, of course, I went and listened to all the episodes on Functional Geekery, and uh, there's about 130 of those, and episodes 64, 65, and 76 are all guests talking about APL. So let's listen to a couple clips from those. I was at a job fair, and one organization said, yeah, we uh, program in APL. So I went back to some older staff figures at my university and I said, hey, what's APL? And this guy who has been doing C for 40, 50 years, he said, oh, it's the silliest language ever. There's no practical use. And I would never use it in a million years, even if you paid me a million dollars too. And to me, this struck me as kind of odd that someone would have such a strong opinion about a language they don't use or have never used. That was Alex from episode 64. And then 12 episodes later, Anthony says something somewhat similar. People who learned APL either absolutely like it or absolutely hate it. So there's, there is no, I find APL okay. And so this is, this is a functional programming podcast. They talk typically about Haskell, Elixir, Elm. Uh, but a couple of these episodes mention that APL is a, a somewhat functional language. It doesn't technically meet the definition, but there are a lot of functional features and feels functional in many ways. Um, and so at this point, after having two of my sisters and a professor and all these, you know, IOTA, you know, there's, there's something going on here. It keeps popping up. I decided that I wanted to go and try it. And that's specifically because in episode 76, Anthony says the following. However, I found the website called tryapl.org, and it is a 
an environment where you can enter APL expressions that are small, so only one-liners, and get direct feedback. And so this is 2019. I'm actually listening to this while driving to Yosemite. Uh, we were on a vacation, and you know my partner's asleep in the car, so what am I doing? Throwing on podcasts. And I'm, so I'm driving through Yosemite, think, oh, I can just go try this online. Like It's kind of like Compiler Explorer. And so uh, this is the story now of me going to try APL. The website exists if you want to go check it out after this. Uh, but so I, I go to tryapl.org. And what's the first thing do you think I type in? Anyone got a guess? Hello world, IOTA. IOTA. Uh, <laughs> so I type in IOTA, because I know it exists. I know that we have IOTA in C++ from APL. So I type in IOTA. It takes a little second to figure out you know, that there's got keyboard shortcuts. But I type IOTA 5, and then I get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's amazing. It's a REPL. So you, you type something, you get feedback instantly. The next thing that I type is a plus sum reduction on IOTA 5. And that's just sum. That's the equivalent of std accumulate in C++. And that sums up the numbers. Once again, instant feedback. I'm, I'm amazed. I've only typed four things, and I don't know how to use this language. And I'm already doing things in APL that will take me you know, lines and lines of code. And then I type a symbol that's similar to reduce that I didn't know. And the output is the following. And immediately, I knew what this was. This is the partial sum, the scan algorithm in C++. And when I type that, I immediately had like a eureka moment, something that I had not recognized from studying algorithms for the past two years in C++, is that these algorithms are sibling algorithms. That's why this talk is called the twin algorithms. I had not recognized that accumulate and partial sum are twin algorithms. And it became immediately obvious because these are symmetric vertically. Like, they're visually symmetric in APL. But accumulate and partial sum, when you're writing those out, from the words that are the names, there's nothing obvious about them that there's any symmetry. And if you, if you look back at this result, the, the, the symmetry is also in the result. The last element of a scan is always the result of a reduction. And I sort of had observed that, but I didn't realize that like these algorithms go together. They are twin algorithms. And uh, I just like, in that moment, I was like, holy smokes, how did I study C++ algorithms for two years? and not make this observation. I gave a talk at C++ Now that won a bunch of awards. And people were like, oh, this guy's an algorithm expert. And I didn't, I didn't recognize that relationship. And it took 10 seconds or maybe a couple minutes with APL to make that insight. And it was at that moment that I knew that I, I wanted to study this language more and figure out what other insights I could have about algorithms. Um, on top of this, in the back of my head, I'm thinking there's sort of two, two three reasons that I, I really started to love APL right off the bat. Now, this, this is a little unfair if you're going to be using C20 or 23, but it's not entirely unfair. In C11, each of the commented sections is the equivalent of getting the same thing in C. And I'm, I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm just saying, in terms of the explorability, the playfulness, the malleability of a language, you can, you can bend APL so quickly and, and try different ideas so fast. This is like, it's overwhelming. It, it makes me a little bit sad. Like, don't get me wrong. C++, it's an amazing language. You can do amazing things with it. People are doing amazing things with it. But the, the dichotomy here, the difference is, is, is massive. I mean, to really highlight it, you get to the S in std vector for everything I typed. Like, I didn't even get to vector. Like, it, it took, I think that's eight or nine characters. Um, and it's just, it's just unbelievable how terse it is. Whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, it's, it's definitely a difference. Um, coming back here, uh, I mentioned before, like, you see the vertical symmetry, accumulate partial sum. Like, I learned this from APL, not from C++. And, uh, and like I said, like, I've given talks where all about algorithms. I even have, from this talk, a slide where you can see that I've made this table you know, comparing and contrasting the differences between algorithms. And the two top gray slots are for the reductions and for the scans. And literally, the only difference is the fact that one's a mapping algorithm and the other one's a reduction algorithm. But yeah, I still didn't put it together that, you know, these, these go side by side. It wasn't until exploring APL that I really found this. And um, it's, it's really can't highlight, like, how important this observation. And maybe people already knew that, but at the time, I had not. And, like, having that come from APL is very significant for me. Um, I did a little bit of opposition research, and uh, these are the languages, actually, that have symmetry in the naming of their scans and reductions. I'm not saying that these are better names or worse names, but um, they are the languages that I found. So Clojure is a Lisp. 
uh, its reduction is reduce, and its scan algorithm is called reductions. I don't know necessarily if I love reductions, but it, at least it makes the, the symmetry there, you know, recognized in the names. Uh, D has fold and cumulative fold, and Kotlin more recently, they I think actually used to call their reduce, reduce and fold, and then they had scan reduce and scan fold, which I thought was terrible, but they actually switched those to now have fold and reduce and running fold and running reduce, which I think is much better than what they had before. So two reasons, the brevity, the relationship between the scan and reduce algorithms, and then there's one final thing that actually I discovered two or three weeks later, and uh, it's the following. Does anybody know what this is? A rotate. That's a rotate. <laughs> Just because in case people miss that. That's a rotate. That is a rotate. It's, a, it's not a joke. This is a rotate. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of silly, but I mean, anyone that's seen my previous talks know that I, I love Sean Perrin talks. And that clip, it's become more than just a meme. It's something for me that represents passion and excitement about learning new things. And when I found out that APL had an actual primitive, an actual glyph for rotate, I fell off my chair and I was, oh my god, this is going in the talk that I give in the future where I get to point at the screen and be like, this is a rotate. Like, ah, uh, it's so awesome. Anyways, these are the three reasons, sort of why I fell in love with APL and then started to explore the language, um, the brevity, um, the relationship between scan and reduce, and the fact that there's a rotate primitive just warms my heart to no end. And so at this point, we've sort of gone through a brief introduction, how I got to the language, what we're going to talk about this talk, and sort of why I love the language. And for the rest of the talk, we're going to go through really what is the meat of this talk, the connections between C++ and APL, a random history of things that I came across over the last two and a half years that really don't fit in super well, but I just, I need, I need to mention them. And then we're going to look at uh, reduce scan, outer product, rotate, and how that affects the way you might think about C++. Hopefully we'll get through it all. And at the very end, we might look at some Harry Potter clips if we have time. So moving on to connections. This might be my favorite section of the talk. Um, specifically, like I mentioned, connections between C++ and APL. We are going to start with, I don't know how to rank the talks that I've seen, but you know, this is definitely in the top 25, maybe top 10. Um, you keep in mind, I've seen thousands of talks, so that it's, uh, it's, you know, it's high up there. And this talk is uh, SEL and its uh, design principles. Um, this talk was given by Alexander Stepanov 20 years ago in 2022 uh, at Adobe. I was talking to Sean just a couple days ago, and he actually mentioned that he was there for that talk. And this is the talk that led to Stepanov working at Adobe. Sean had a conversation with uh, uh, Stepanov after this talk and said, oh, you know, you should consider coming to Adobe and you know, doing some engineering work together. So um, let's take a look what uh, Stepanov was uh, talking about in this talk. What I will try to do today is not to teach you STL. It's a long thing to do. I don't think I could do it in a single presentation anyway. Uh, what I will try to explain is, first of all, why I did what I did, as it were. You know, what are the principles? What, what are the fundamental ideas from which some particular design decisions follow? Right? The intuitions behind, behind the thing. So that's what this talk is about. I highly recommend, if you haven't seen this talk, um, I'll have a, a link to all of the links and talks and podcasts that I, I mentioned in this on my GitHub. Um, and it, I, I, I didn't mention it at the beginning, but you can go find this, the slide deck on my repo right now. It's under content, uh, under a talks folder. Highly recommend going and watching this full talk. I don't have, I think it's a 90 minute talk. I don't have time to show all the clips, but we're gonna look at, we're gonna look at two more. And uh, this next clip just blew me away. The second source, and in some sense, in my opinion, a marvelous source are other libraries. Because these are some things which people did use before. Some, some arrangements which people found out to be useful before. And you could see borrowings in STL. I mean, you know, I don't know how well you remember some STL functions, but very clear that things like accumulate reduction comes from APL. But very clear that things like accumulate reduction comes from APL. When I saw this, it reminded me of a clip, or not a clip, a soccer game I watched in 2010. Huge Netherlands fan, and uh, I'm going to show it in a sec, but here's Stepanov. Very clearly, things like accumulate comes from APL. We knew that IOTA comes from APL. I had no idea that accumulate came from APL. I was so excited. 
It, I don't think the last time I was this excited was when uh, Holland scored in this soccer game. As it does now, and Bronkhurst! Oh, that has got to be one of the great goals of the World Cup final! I watched it a couple times. It's, uh... He's a defender. He's a defender. What is he doing taking the shot from him? How I felt when I when this goal was scored was the exact same way I felt when I when I heard Stepanov say that accumulate was from APL. It's just it's so awesome. I, I mean, it's awesome because I'm passionate about APL. But I like I'd never I'd, I'd heard that IOTA obviously, but I'd never heard anything about other algorithms having inspired, let alone directly come from a language like APL. Let's watch or listen to and watch the rest of that clip. But very clear that things like accumulate reduction comes from APL, right? So there is a lot of things borrowed from APL. There are lots of things borrowed, stolen, whatever, from Common Lisp. I mean, you know, I freely give credit because I did steal, I did take it from there, right? There are things which clearly go back to Smalltalk. I mean, STL is not Smalltalk-like library at all, but the notion, I mean, the idea of having sets and maps, these kind of data structures associated with data structures, which are not present in either APL or LISP, you know, was suggested to me by, by Smalltalk. So again, you try, you try to look at everywhere you could find things. There are a lot of things borrowed from APL, but also from other languages like Common Lisp and Smalltalk. And I think this is amazing. I mean, one of my favorite uh, tweets, which we're going to see later, is from Ben Dean, where he's talking about learning languages from different paradigms. A lot of people don't know, before Stepanov was building the STL, which came to completely affect the way that C++ code is written today in generic programming, uh, he was advocating, ad, advocating for and teaching Scheme. He was, a, he was a lisper. There's so many people that we think of as, you know, insert next to this language that have histories where they studied, you know, before he wrote the STL in C++, he wrote it in Java, he wrote it in Scheme, he wrote it in Ada, and he was searching for ideas and crystallizing, you know, what he was building, what became the STL. And, you know, that's kind of one of the points of this talk is to not necessarily go and learn a different language because you're going to start, you know, writing in it day to day, but it's going to affect the way that you program in the language that you do write in. Um, so we have Accumulate from APL. We also have, I mentioned it earlier, no, nope. IOTA. What do these two things have in common? Uh, bad names, eh, not what I'm looking for. It's, it's very high level. Uh, think of where you might find them. They're both in the numeric header. And in C++ 98, there was only four algorithms. C++ 11, there was five. Anybody know another one? Partial. Yep. Uh, uh, uh. Partial sum. Is partial sum from APL? Maybe. Let's go see if we can answer that question. Kenneth Iverson, the individual that wrote APL back in the 60s, won a Turing Award and gave a very, very well-known talk. And there's a paper associated with that talk called Notation as a tool of thought, where he talks about how the notation of APL, which was previously not a programming language, it was a teaching notation called Iverson notation used for just teaching. Um, it affects the way you think. If you go to page three of this paper, and you zoom in, where he starts to talk about scans, look how he refers to them as partial sums. Now, I'm not saying definitively <laughs> partial sum is from APL, but that's a very famous paper, and this is where he's introducing scans, and he refers to them twice as partial sums. Um, so I would say, based on this, that partial sum is from APL. What's another algorithm that, of the two remaining from C++11 in the uh, numeric header? Anyone know? Adjacent difference. That's the fifth one we'll look at. And inner product. Inner product, if we skip to the fifth page or sixth page of this uh, notation as a tool of thought paper, we can zoom in again. Anyone see it? That's now four out of five. So I'm going to say the inner product also came from APL, although, I mean, inner product 
predates APL, but still. Um, and that leaves the one adjacent difference, which uh, I was not able to find that in the notation as a tool of thought paper. Um, but if you look at each of these algorithms in APL, you'll note that they are expressible like very succinctly. Not only are they expressible, but like very succinctly. Um, technically, uh, it, adjacent difference, this is basically a, uh, it takes two elements at a time and then performs a binary operation. It's called an n-wise reduction, and that two is, is customizable. You can do it with a three or a four. Um, that's actually incorrect if you know the specifics of adjacent difference. Does anybody know why that does not perfectly map to the adjacent difference in C++? Uh, that is actually a difference, but that's not the one I'm looking for. Um, <laughs> the one I'm looking for is that in adjacent difference, when you take two elements at a time, it, is, it subtracts the first one from the second one. Whereas this one is just applying it, you know, first minus second. Uh, but luckily in APL, we have something called the W combinator. They call it a swap. Um, you just put that in there, poof, switches the arguments that you pass to a binary operation. You might think that looks a little silly, kind of like an emoji. This is, in my opinion, the most important combinator of all the combinators introduced in the SKI combinatory logic. That's my next talk called Composition and Intuition to be given at a future conference. Uh, as much as I would love to go on a um, you know, wax rhapsodic about kind of combinatory logic, uh, we'll have to save that for another day. And technically, you could argue that these don't map perfectly to the numeric algorithms either. And that's because one of these has the default binary operation encoded in it, but the others don't really, except for IOTA, because that's different. So really, if we want to map to the default binary operations, we have to add these. So plus is the default for accumulate and partial sum. Uh, inner product, obviously, plus and multiplies, and then minus. I've talked about this in previous talks, but it irritates me to no end that partial sum and adjacent difference bake the semantics of the default binary operation into the name of the algorithm. It becomes immediately, you know, uh, obfuscated. The things you can do with adjacent difference. You might have seen either in one of my talks or Ben Dean's talks that you can do, you know, Fibonacci or I think yeah, Fibonacci sequence with adjacent difference. Um, and uh, you're using plus though to do Fibonacci. So you're using a, an algorithm called adjacent difference to add elements together. You know, we can do better with our naming. And um, this actually I think is is fascinating because. Uh, I, the same thing that I showed, the table that I showed from my algorithm intuition talk, um, you know, I advocated for there not being default binary operations. There are people that'll say that, you know, the defaults make them more usable because you don't actually need to learn, you know, lambdas or the function objects that come with this uh, include functional header. But I think that having better names that don't encode the semantics of the default binary operation that doesn't exist makes it more obvious after you get over that little extra learning bump, you know, what you can do with these algorithms. Um, partial sum, you can do partial product, you can do partial bunch of things, partial max, partial min. Um, the last thing I'm gonna say about the uh, Stepanov talk is that um, he shows sort of a genesis of STL and in the middle there is uh, a reference to the work that he did in Scheme. And uh, if you go to, that's sort of dark, but it's stepanovpapers.com, uh, he has his scheme notes, which is I think uh, 90 pages of scheme. And in the midst of that too, he shows his initial implementation in scheme of what would become stood accumulate and references once again that you know, this is borrowed from Ken Iverson uh, in APL, which I think is just awesome. So I haven't fully read through this, but the pieces that I have, it's, it's illuminating. Um, you need to know a little bit of list, but once again, like I said, learn other languages. On top of all the algorithms that I'm saying, you know, in the numeric header have now come from APL, there's also other names, um, which is less important, but I, I wanted to highlight it. So the scan, that comes from APL. Ceiling and floor, a lot of people don't know this, comes from APL. That's Iverson that came up with that notation. Um, so uh, pretty cool, I think, that really this language has affected, you know, other languages in C++ way more than we think it has. Um, and we just don't have that history. Um, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is the tweet that I mentioned earlier from Ben, one of my favorite. Ben Dean, is a, if, if you don't know, has given some fantastic talks at conferences. I highly encourage you follow him on Twitter and look up his talks. Um, this is probably one of my favorite tweets of all time. Um, learn computational paradigms, C++, Lisp, Haskell, Smalltalk, Prolog, Fourth, APL. Um, when you're staying in the same paradigm, you're not changing the way you think. You're learning you know, about garbage collection, maybe if you go to Python or Java, but you're not really changing the way, you're not putting an extra tool in your tool belt um, to, to, to solve problems differently. Um, 
Because he had tweeted about APL, I went and searched if there was any other tweets that Ben had given on APL. And uh, I ended up coming across the, uh, uh, another similar one where he says, you know, the same thing he's responding, you know, what language should I learn next? Um, but I ended up coming across a Barry Revson tweet, if you know who he is, as an active member on the committee. And um, <laughs> he says, uh, people really hate the name IOTA, yada, yada, yada. And then he says, you know, there's two other worst names, function and map. Um, but then Ben responds to this and says, the intersection of C++ programmers and APL fans is small. And Barry Revson replies, I'm guessing it's zero to a first approximation. Well, Barry, I hope you're watching this talk. I know you're not in the room, but not only are you wrong. I mean, Ben was right. It probably is small. But Barry is wrong. Not only am I a huge fan, but so was Stepanov. And if Stepanov was, you know, maybe other people should consider giving it a shot. Um, so that ends the sort of connections, and now we're going to go through the ma uh, sort of the many sort of mini histories that I have. Uh, but first, we're just going to talk about what is APL. I've been talking all about it, but I haven't really introduced it. Um, and uh, like I said, some mini histories after this. So I'm not going to spend 20 minutes giving you uh, a history of all the different array languages. Uh, I just am going to give you a very high level sort of introduction. So APL was, as a programming language, introduced in 1966. Um, it technically wasn't released publicly at IBM until 1967, uh, but as a programming language, that's when I consider sort of the, the year it was introduced. However, um, it was, a, like I said, a notation for teaching before, and Iverson was developing it back at Harvard in the late 1950s. And in 1962, that's a year that many people quote the language actually started, that's when he published a book called A Programming Language, which is where the name of the language comes from. Um, since then, it's had really two major derivative or children, children language, languages. Uh, J was developed by Ken Iverson and Roger Huey in the 1990s, uh, and K was a language that was developed by Arthur Whitney. It was sort of two of his protégés. Um, Dialog APL is sort of the dialect of APL that is most popularly used today. It's the one that, uh, the company that hosts uh, the Try APL uh, website. And uh, from there, sort of, K went on to become Q and was purchased. We'll talk about that in a sec. Um, there was an experimental language by Marshall Lockbaum, one of my co-hosts on the ArrayCast podcast. Um, and he is then sort of no longer has developed that. That was an experimental language and is now working on BQN, which is kind of a combination of, of all the array languages and has some really, really interesting ideas, a couple of which I'm going to touch on later. Um, I mentioned sort of Roger Huey and Arthur Whitney. Arthur Whitney. Um, Roger Huey's on the left, uh, and uh, Arthur Whitney's on the right, and Ken Iverson is the one in both of the photos. Which brings us to our first uh, mini history number one, which is, is maybe one of the most amazing stories that I've come across um, in sort of my researching the array languages. So uh, Arthur Whitney is this individual here. He's known as um, sort of a god, for lack of a better word, within the array community. Um, there's stories about him and his genius. He's very reclusive. He doesn't give interviews. There's one uh, interview that you can find online that Brian Cantrell had with him. Um, but very, very smart individual. And he is uh, known, less known for A and A+, but for being the author of K and Q. And more recently, he's working on the latest iteration of his sort of array language called Shakti. Um, less well known is that he's actually written this many languages. Um, K has not different dialects, different languages. I asked him about the different dialects when I met him back in February of 2020, right before the pandemic started in New York. And he sort of was, he got upset when I called them dialects. He said, they're not dialects. They're completely different languages. You know, or not completely different. They evolve on the ideas. But he said, you know, each time I write a K, I start from scratch. I throw everything out and I start from scratch. And I, I use the ideas and you, you know, a lot of times you finish a project and you say, you know, now that I've done the project, I know how I could have done it correctly. That's what he's doing and he's doing it over and over and over again. And he said, the better way to think about this is that they're lisps. They're dialects of lisps. You don't consider scheme and, you know, uh, common list the same language or closure the same language. They are in the same family, but they are different and they experiment with different ideas. The amazing part of this story, in my opinion, is that um, K4, which was later uh, sort of evolved into Q, uh, was from a company called KX. And uh, this company was bought for $100 million. And at the time, the K executable was 50 kilobytes. The joke, at the, the joke in the community is that it's the most expensive piece of software per kilobyte ever sold. Um, and uh, yeah, when I found out this out, like, it's, it's, it's hardly even mentioned. In order to find out how much the company was bought for, you have to go and find multiple different articles that they became a minority shareholder, and then they ended up buying the rest of the shares. And you can see the numbers, 36 million pounds and 53. But like, the point is, is 
clearly there has to be some value in this paradigm in languages if a company, First Derivatives, they, they operate in finance, was willing to pay $100 million. And uh, Q is a language also worth looking into because although K uses ASCII symbols, Q is a basically a wordified version of K. So a lot of people find it an easier way to onboard. Second amazing mini history story, uh, in my opinion. Um, this is the IBM 5100, was released in 1975. I've tried to buy one, you can't. I mean, maybe you can. On eBay one time, I saw in the past that was, someone was sold for $15,000. I don't have that kind of money to spend on an old broken computer. Um, but the history of this computer, in my opinion, is amazingly fascinating. Uh, and uh, you might be able to tell is that there's APL symbols on the keys here. Uh, and this just delighted me. I was like, holy smokes. One of, the, one of the first, I think, I'm not sure if this is the first uh, sort of portable computer, but it was marketed that way. And uh, it had APL symbols on it. And if you take a look at a, a different part of this computer, does anybody notice something? I mean, I should have put that together when I saw the APL symbols on the keyboard. It's not like they just did that for fun. But there's a switch. This computer has two different modes in 1975, one of the first portable computers. It has a basic mode and an APL mode. And there is this story, stories, in the APL community of uh, basically Bill Gates showing up here and there. Um, I'm once again going to do some sort of compelling quotes things. Uh, and this all revolves around Bill Gates. So once again, not going to read this stuff. Um, you can find these on a website that stands for APL quotations and anecdotes. Um, there's one from Eric Iverson uh, talking about where uh, Bill Gates came to visit IP Sharpen Associates, which, which was a company located here in Toronto. Toronto, actually, Canada, was a, a mecca of APLers. Um, so once again, if you're watching this on YouTube, feel free to pause. Um, there's another one from Bob Bernecki, also lives here locally and worked here uh, at IP Sharpen Associates. And this one's the worst of all. I apologize. I don't expect anyone to read this. But once again, if you're on YouTube, feel free to hit pause and uh, read. But in, in here, it refers to this ETI article in 1979 where Gates was being interviewed. And I managed to find this article with the help of a couple people in the Ray community. And uh, it's called APL Good for the Brain. And it's an eight-page article. When I found it, it was actually single-page PDFs. And I had to download each one and put them. But it's in my uh, GitHub repo if you want to go read this later. If you skip to like page six, um, it talks about Bill Gates and Microsoft in 1979. And uh, it's, it's an amazing read. We're not going to go through the whole thing. But uh, they refer to Microsoft as a, it's a small software house at the time. Like, it's, a, it's not the Bill Gates we know today that's the richest guy in the world. Um, and uh, it's talking about that Bill Gates as the president of the company and that the APL, is uh, the APL job is largely his baby. Bill Gates was a huge APL fan. Wrote an interpreter, I think, at the end of his time at Harvard, although I think he dropped out. Um, and for a long time, he was focused on getting APL, not just basic, on his personal computer. Um, and uh, it goes on to say that uh, he's gonna, he says, APL will see an incredible, incredible increase in popularity uh, because it's going to be exposed to so many new people. He, his, at one point in time, his goal was making sure that APL was on the personal computer. And I think it's amazing because when you go and read the quotes, the stories, a part of the story is Bill Gates was doing this tour of North America to figure out ideas what to do with his personal computer. And when he stopped by IP Sharpen Associates, the main vendor, one of the main vendors of APL at the time, um, they basically turned him away. They said, oh, that's really cool what you're doing, but like our business is in mainframes. We make all our money, you know, a personal computer, that's not, it's not going to be a big thing maybe one of the biggest mistakes ever made by that company. And we could be living in an entirely different world where instead of all of our languages being inspired by Fortran and BASIC, you know, they were a lot more influenced, not just you know, in, in the numeric header and one small library of a language, but we could have a lot more notational languages. And we don't live in that world, but potentially that could have been the case. Um, if you go on to read the next page, uh, it's, it's super interesting. You know, it says that the APL uh, project was started in 1976. Um, and this, was, uh, this article was coming out in 79. And it's interesting because when you juxtapose this with a more famous uh, you know, article from Bill Gates, this was the, I believe, uh, the open letter to uh, is it shareholders or something. But this was basically, Bill Gates got really upset because everyone was stealing software. And he's like, you know, how am I supposed to build a business if you guys won't pay for software? And in this uh, letter, 
uh, there's a part where basically he mentions that we're, we're actively writing APL, but you know, what's the point? Because if you guys are just gonna steal it anyways, we'll just give you, you'd already have basic, if we can't sell this and build a business. But the point is, is APL gets mentioned, you know? P Bill Gates is obviously known for Microsoft and, and being rich, but it, there was at one point in time where he was not famous and he was trying to you know, affect his products with APL, which I, I think is super cool. All right, moving on to some random facts, PhDs in APL. Um, at one point I was just working my way through APL papers. Uh, I came across this. This was from like two years ago. This website doesn't even exist. It's been rebranded uh, to look like this. But if you zoom in, I'll give people a couple seconds. Um, does anybody notice a familiar name in that text? Walter Brown. Walter Brown, who was in charge of the movie night on Monday, gave a talk yesterday, and is giving a talk right now at the same time. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can watch all of them. Walter Brown did his PhD on APL. How many of you knew that? One person in a room of roughly 40? Like, like I said, it's not just Stepanov. Everyone has these extremely interesting histories, not just because it's on APL, but like people don't, like how many people would have thought to, oh, what did you research? Because he's had such a long and storied career and has given talks on so many different things, is that at one point he was spending years working on a PhD and a dissertation in APL. Um, another random fact I came across, Go, there's three creators of the Go language. Uh, they're all on screen here. They previously worked on other languages. Um, each one of these three individuals individually wrote an APL interpreter at one point in time. Um, and Rob, Rob Pike actually has a project called Ivy, which is sort of an APL-inspired calculator that takes, you know, has the name IOTA, et cetera. And it's written backed in Go, so it does all these really fast, big number computations. Um, and Go is also another language. It uses it differently, but it also has a construct called IOTA um, for doing something with in, uh, in, creating uh, integer sequences. Um, no raw loops. How many times have we heard that week in different talks, people referring to it? Um, I just heard it in the previous talk I was at before the lunch break. Um, I happen to own norawloops.com. Uh, <laughs> it actually does not point to anything right now, but I think what I'm gonna do is basically, once this recording is online, I'm gonna point that <laughs> uh, website URL to this talk. Um, so we're gonna a little bit of a recursion going on there. Um, as I was going uh, you know, through my learning of the array paradigm, uh, I came across uh, a website called nsl.com, which didn't know what that stood for. I went to the website, and it stands for No Stinking Loops. Once again, kind of fell off my chair. We're here, here I am in C++. We've sort of popularized the no raw loops from Sean's talks. And uh, in the array community, they almost have, it's not the same semantics, because they don't want loops ever. Uh, it's not just raw loops, they don't want loops at all. But still, I, I, I found this and I was just like, what the heck? And um, I believe the individual behind this website, Stephen Apter, um, we had him on uh, one of the episodes and his story is absolutely amazing. He's done crazy things. He has a, a, a lazy K implemented in um, uh, sort of the KRC or Sassel style combinators that compiles down and does all this crazy stuff. Check out this website, www.nsl.com for a, a ton of crazy cool stuff. Um, and I think this is the last random fact before we get to sort of looking at more code heavy stuff is a negative index. Um, for those of you that have programmed in Python, you know that you can access the last element in a list by going negative one. Um, all of these languages have that and it comes from APL. Um, which is an circle actually, I think, has negative indexing for some of their compile time stuff, which is Sean Baxter's project. Um, anyways, I just found all these small things in small different languages have, have, can be traced all the way back to APL. Uh, so anyways, end of mini histories and random facts. Now we're gonna start talking about um, sort of how APL can affect the way you think about programming. Um, reduce is gonna be less of that, because uh, I just have a bunch of random things to say about reduce. So this is, if you've ever seen my Google Translate, um, tables that are sort of uh, the namings or semantically equivalent things in different programming languages. Uh, this is reduce and fold. This is a bit fuzzy because anyone that has studied reductions knows that there are a plethora of different kinds. There's left folds, there's right folds, there's ones that are non-deterministic in the order that can affect the result. Um, you know, the way you pass your accumulator and the binary operation, you know, all different flavors, but I sort of all put them on the same page. Um, and you can see, uh, reduce is the most popular by far, um, and uh, you know I'll just scroll down to the bottom, and you can see uh, that uh, yeah, some interesting things to observe. Insert is uh, what they call it in JMBQN, which is rather interesting. Over 
is an interesting name, in my opinion, from, from Q, because you're distributing a binary operation over a number of elements. Um, but let's go back to our code example. So I showed this, and I, I said at the time, and this is a little bit unfair, because this is kind of C++11. And if you really want to nitpick, like you could say, well, you don't need to construct the std vector each time for each example. You know, you can reuse some of, you know, the, from the first example, you can reuse it for the second one. But I was trying to show the equivalent coming right from APL. In C++ uh, 20, 3, you can write this now, um, which is, in my opinion, much, much, ni much, much nicer. So we have uh, the IOTA view from C20. Um, the bike shedding on the naming of fold less, left first might change, um, but there are a, a set of four algorithms fold left, fold right, and fold left, right, uh, fold left, right first. Um, basically, the difference between the underscore first and the non underscore first ones is that some of them uh, use the first element of the operation, whereas other ones require sort of a, a starting value. Um, and the ones that require, uh, don't require a starting value uh, return an optional value. So you can see at the end you have to go dot value in order to unwrap that optional to get the value out. Um, partial sum is not going to make it into C++23 because we consider that a tier 2 algorithm. That will probably get into C++26. Um, I would really prefer to write this code uh, the following way. Um, note that because fold left first is not a view, you can't pipe into it. But uh, Barry Revzin, previously mentioned in this talk, has a proposal out to introduce a uh, pipeline operator, which basically is a generic way of being able to potentially, with a placeholder, which might be the underbar or dollar sign, it's you know being bike shedded at the moment. I don't know if this will make it in, uh, but I, I really hope it does because uh, this kind of code um, is the way that I'm used to reading things linearly in APL. You read linearly in APL, and also the uh, formatting facilities that are getting in C20 and 23 um, prevent us from having to do all that, you know, std cout stuff, which uh, this is much, much cleaner in my opinion. Uh, to recap, I mentioned those four algorithms. Names might change are coming in C23, but these are basically all of the scan and reduce, the twin algorithms that exist in C++. So we started off with accumulate and partial sum. We got the parallel versions of these, which have different requirements, um, which I'm going to talk about just in a sec here. And the inclusive scan and inclusive scan are slightly different in terms of the results they give you. Uh, but you know, they're very similar in that regard. And then we're getting you know, four different fold algorithms. Uh, so accumulate, reduce, and then four different folds. You got lots of options. Is this the best design? Obviously not. But when you are dealing with a language that you know maintains backwards compatibility, we're doing the best we can. Um, I mentioned that uh, the C++ 17 parallel algorithms have different requirements. Um, I'm not going to go through this super in detail, but you know if you want, take a screenshot or find my slides later and post this. You know, uh, I think this is something super useful to know. And um, Note that uh, the direction, you know, a lot of people think accumulate, it's uh, fold left. You know, semantically, that's by default, but it's really based on the iterators. If you've got reverse iterators, it's a fold right. Um, and uh, most importantly, reduce here requires associativity and commutativity. And if you've listened to Bryce and I on uh, algorithm, our podcast ADSP, um, we've talked about how there is a missing algorithm. You might think, holy smokes, we've got, we've got what is that, uh, six different reduction algorithms now. You know, do we need more? Uh, I would argue that we do, because the requiring associativity and commutativity is um, over-restricting for some cases. There, there is a case where you might want to do uh, a associative only um, a reduction. And that can still be parallelized, uh, but um, we don't have that. And in fact, in certain libraries uh, that NVIDIA, the company I work for, we have uh, these algorithms, not the associative only reduce. But when people want an associative only reduce, they'll reach for inclusive scan. Because inclusive scan doesn't require commutativity. It only requires associativity. So sometimes when people want an associative only reduction, they'll reach for the scan algorithm and then just take the last element, which, um, you know, as I'm saying this, I'm thinking, well, we should probably add that uh, if people are doing that. But yes, um, we're missing a reduction. But you know, if you ever need to refer back to what are the requirements, which way are we folding, um, this is a great reference uh, to do that for. Uh, I showed these five algorithms from numeric. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole STL header, but you can very easily implement many other algorithms uh, in C++ or from C++ in APL. Um, and I'm going to focus in on four of these. Um, and this might be my favorite slide of the whole talk. So BQN is at the bottom. It's uh, the most modern array language. And APL is at the top. Very briefly, what's happening here is we're defining a function 
Omega and uh, alpha alpha are the two inputs. Alpha alpha is basically a uh, predicate function. Um, so it's a function. It's, it's not restricting it because restricting it, it's a dynamically typed language. You can technically pass any kind of function in. But for these, you want to pass a predicate function in, something that's going to return true or false. And then it's going to apply that predicate function. It's going to map that over your argument. And then you basically have just a set of reductions. And I think that this is absolutely beautiful code. The symmetry here is so obvious. First of all, in both BQN and APL, you can immediately tell they're all reductions. Reduce, 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 reduce. Reduce, 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 reduce. Note, and actually in BQN, reductions uh, are, mod are called modifiers, and they're superscript, which makes it parsing easier. But it's, it's interesting. I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's just an interesting language design decision. Um, and you can see here, too, that because of the symmetry in the binary operations, not the fact that they're one character, but just that they're symmetric, it's immediately obvious. So we have logical or and logical and. And in C++, you actually have to spell out std colon, std colon colon, logical underscore or, logical underscore and. And the or and the and, once again, there's nothing like, we know what those mean semantically, but there's nothing symmetric in the naming of and and or. Um, and I, I just think this is more beautiful. Even too, uh, you can see that for none of, it's just the negation of another algorithm that we have. Like, and you can put that together because we know the semantics of these sort of predicate algorithms, if you will. But in the, in the implementations of these in APL and BQN, it just becomes so obvious. More so even, too, for the count if. Like, count if, you wouldn't necessarily associate with all of, none of, any of these predicate functions. But it's, it's just a binary operation. That's the only difference. And if you actually look at the implementation in uh, Microsoft's STL or GCC or uh, Claim, you, you'll actually see the symmetry, and it's just a difference of a binary operation, but it's, it's not as obvious as it is when looking at these in BQN and APL. And one last thing that I want to note is that um, you might notice that count. I've added count in the BQN example, but not in APL. And it's, it's a different color. And it also doesn't have an underscore in the front. Uh, BQN is one of the only languages that exists that has basically different types of functions. Like We have no way in C++, or at least not that I know of, where we can change like, we, we always invoke with parentheses, basically, or stood invoke. But like, you need parentheses to, to apply a function. Um, you don't need parentheses in APL to apply a function, or in BQN. And when you are defining what is known as a modifier or an operator, basically a higher order function, it takes a predicate function, that has higher precedence than other functions. Because you're basically creating a new function. When you take a generic fold, and then you bind that with a binary operation, you've now created, if it's plus a sum, if it's times its product, you've created a new function that you're then going to apply to something. And uh, this leads to some really, really interesting things. And I don't know of any other language that basically has a way of having like a hierarchy of functions. And I think it's, I think it's very interesting. And it's going to be interesting to see if other languages start adopting things like this. Like Haskell, for as a functional language that it is, Function application has a precedence of 10. And any operator that you define can never go above 10. The max is 9. So it's all, function application is always going to be the highest priority thing. There's no way, unless if you change the language, um, in, in which case you don't have Haskell anymore. Um, so it's, it's not possible in certain functional languages. Um, scam. This is uh, the first sort of programming problem that we're going to look at. But once again, before we do that, let's take a look at the Google Translate. Interesting to look at the, the different names of these. We saw some of them earlier when we looked at the uh, reductions, um, et cetera. Uh, note that uh, in Python, they call this accumulate. Very unfortunate. Um, yeah, and even actually some array languages, unfortunately, call it accumulate as well. Um, running reduce, like I said, it's kind of neat. But yeah, scan overwhelmingly. Whether you even think, I've heard many people say that scan is not a good name for this algorithm because scanning you associate with sort of IO. Um, but yeah. These are sort of the name breakdown. And uh, first, I'm going to walk you through how to solve this programming problem in APL. And then we're going to look at what, how, how that APL solution might affect the way you program this in C++. So I actually borrowed this from uh, the PLDI conference that I was at uh, a month ago. And um, we're going to look at basically a not equals scan. So we saw a plus scan already. It's basically you know, calculating the incremental results in a reduction. Um, but we're going to do a, an extremely fancy scan. 
and uh, it hopefully will open your eyes to what you can do with a scan. So the goal of this is we've got, you know, a hello CPP North with, um, you know, tags around it, and we want to get rid of the tags, something that you wouldn't really think of as being parallelizable. But we'll see that if you code it in a, an array kind of way, it's a very parallelizable function. So um, the first thing we need to do is we need to identify where all the open brackets are. And so uh, the result of this is basically going to be a bunch of ones and zeros. Note that in APL and array languages, true and false are one and zero. And it's kind of hard to tell, but if you put this right underneath, you can see that each of the ones corresponds to where a left bracket shows up. Uh, so we put that back down there. And um, because it's going to get a little bit crowded on the left, we're just going to move this up and over. But note that if you were doing this in a REPL, it would be in front. It's just slide wear, so we're going to make this a little bit easier. Also, too, we're going to build up, uh, this is called sort of an anonymous function or a defund. Once again, omega is the argument here. And by adding the braces, this evaluates the exact same thing we had. Um, but it's just going to make it a little bit clearer. Um, really, we want to identify both the open and close angle brackets here, not just, not just the first one. And uh, a way to do that is basically using this membership primitive. It's just saying, is uh, each of the letters in our string, uh, do they exist in this shorter string? And so now we have ones for both the open and the close. And this is where our not equal scan comes in. So this is, really, you have to spend some time thinking about what's happening here. Um, we have some state that's going to have a value, and it's going to check if it's not equal to the next element. And so if we, if we take back a second, it starts at 1, and then the next element is 0. So those are not equal to each other, so it returns 1. And now your state is 1. And so then it looks at the next one, which is also 0. So those aren't equal to each other, so it's going to be 1. So as long as it's zeros, it's going to continue to return you 1 until you hit a 1, in which case your state is 1, and so now 1 equals 1, and so then it's going to switch to 0. And so it's basically going to have this toggling effect. Anytime you hit a 1, it's going to switch the state until you hit another 1. Um, and so what this turns into, basically, is that in between all the 1s, you get 1s, and then zeros until you get the next set, and you end up getting this mask, which is basically consecutive 1s in between uh, what you had 1s in your mask before. So, that might not have made a ton of mistakes, ton of sense. Try to think about this later on. Like it took me a while to understand really what was happening and like taking apart that when you are doing a scan, you have both your current element and your accumulated state, and you need to think about the state. It takes a while to wrap your head around this, but this is this is not something I would have ever thought you could do with a scan, um, which is which is amazing in my opinion. Um, and now what we want to do is we want to basically filter so that we're dropping anything that corresponds to a 1. Well, in APL, there is a filter, but it does the opposite of that. It drops things that correspond to zeros. So if we just logically negate and switch everything from a 0 to a 1, so trues become falses and falses become trues, we can do that with a little tilde, and then everything there just switched. And now if we do a filter, that's basically the slash, and we're using the W combinator because we want the mask to be on the left. But basically, we're just using this mask now to drop anything corresponding to a 1. So if we if we juxtapose these two things and you sort of look, anything that's next to a 1, we're going to keep. And anything that's on top of a 0, we're going to get rid of. And uh, if we do that, we end up with this. Uh oh OK, well, we've messed up here because when we are using that 1 to create that mask, we're actually including the last thing that we split on. So we need to slightly modify this. And we're going to do that very quickly. I'm basically adding a logical OR. And I'm increasing the mask so that it just includes that initial or that last one. And when we do that, we end up with hello C++ North. So I realized that probably I lost, if not half of the room, most of the room with that. But the point is here that you can do extremely fancy things with scans that like are bread and butter idioms to APLers. But like as a C++ developer, C++ developer, I would never think, oh, I need to strip tags from some HTML. Let me reach for my scan, throw in a, a not equals and a couple other things, and then poof. And uh, we'll see that this is actually, these are just a bunch of scans and transforms. And the filter is the one thing that's the hardest to parallelize. But um, in parallel algorithm libraries, you can basically implement a filter with a copy if, which we have a parallel version of that, which is, which is pretty neat. So let's switch to how we might do this in C++ now. And we're going to try and translate this APL array solution to C++. So we're using a string view uh, from C++17. We're going to call this filter out HTML tags. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to build up that mask where everyone, every uh, element that equals a left chevron or a right chevron is equal to a true. 
uh, and everything else is equal to false. So we just use this with the views transform from C++20, pretty straightforward. And uh, we gotta store this in a temporary because we're gonna need to use this twice, which is a little bit irritating. Um, the next thing we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna do our basically two things at the same time. So the first thing to note is on the last line, we're doing the partial sum with a std not equal to. You know, a lot more characters in C++, but hey, that's the language we're dealing with here. Um, and then we're doing a zip with, which is basically taking a binary operation and applying that to two sequences. And those two sequences are basically the uh, not equal scan and the original mask. The original mask is to get that last one that was missing so that we don't get the right angle brackets. Um, zip width actually is coming in C++23, but it's gonna be called, I believe, uh, zip transform because uh, the width is taken from Haskell and there's not actually a, not a lot of other languages. I think OCaml or another language might use it. Um, but transform is kind of what we use for um, single range transforms or multiple range transforms, right? You can do two, uh, two ranges you call a std transform. And um, we are uh, zipping this with our string view at the end. So that's kind of subtle. You can see that we're inside our zip, outside our zip width, we're zipping again so that we can get tuples, pairs, that are basically the, letter, the characters and then the true or false value that we're gonna filter based on. Um, after this, we call a filter and we're filtering based on the true or false value. So the, the characters are the second element in our tuple, and the first element is the true or false, is, is this something we want to keep? So if, if the, the std get gets the first element out of the tuple, this is really irritating. I wish, you know, there's a, been a couple language features that have been suggested. My favorite would be uh, structured bindings and generic lambdas. So if you could destructure, instead of writing T, if you could write bracket A comma B, then I wouldn't have to go std colon colon get zero. Um, I could just, you know, go A and that would be much nicer. Or there might even be a nicer construct in the future. And note that uh, there's two different ways we can do this. I'm using not, so I'm negating because technically we have the opposite of what we want right now. Um, but you could also, if you wanted, you could pipe an extra transform to do the negation if you wanted. There's a couple different ways to write this. Um, but once we have this, we filter. Um, we basically just want to transform because at this point, we want to get rid of that true false value. Like all we have left is the trues and all we care about the characters at this point and then uh, we can call just a ranges to std string. So uh, the ranges to is coming in C++23, the zip with and zip are coming in C++23, partial sum won't be there uh, until C++26, uh, filter, transform, uh, and string view have all been there since either C++17 or C++20. String view is 17, uh, filter and transform are 20. Um, all of this is on GitHub. This is using ranges because obviously I don't have access to a C++ 23 compiler with features that haven't been uh, created yet. Microsoft is leading the way, so it's soon on Gobble you might be able to actually get um, some of this stuff working. Uh, but I actually, I don't like this at all. I mean, it's, it was a cool exercise to get this working, translating it from APL, but this like, I think this is way too much. Um, the worst thing about this in my opinion is that we are having to store the angle bracket mask as a temporary because we need it twice. You know, I, when you're piping and using these views, you have to always do things linearly. There's no way to sort of like fork something two different directions and then merge it again. That's not possible with views. Um, unless if we get the pipe operator. Specifically, and I'm gonna explain because there's a lot of stuff going on here. I got rid of all the basically these, the function objects and I'm using a library that I've written called Blackbird for combinator stuff. But focus right now just on the pipes. So the pipe operator that Barry Revson has proposed, uh, the R2, the second version of the proposal, comes with a proposed placeholder, which is the two underbars after you know, the zip width, and then it says underbar or underbar, and then underbar, comma, underbar. In the paper, it uses a dollar sign. But the idea is that if we introduce a, uh, a, a pipe operator, we could also introduce some kind of placeholder that works with the pipe operator that instead of just saying by default, you know, always use the first location of your function, you know, use the placeholder to say this is where I want my input to go. And if we have that, we potentially could say make it go multiple places. This isn't just useful for zip with functions like Cartesian product where you're taking multiple views or sequences and you want to build up some, you know, combination. Like a lot of times if you're using an iota sequence, you just want to use two iota sequences that are identical to get tuples of, you know, indices to map into something. It's, it's a very common thing you want to do. And I really, really hope that the ISO committee um, goes, you know, if this ends up getting in, goes with the placeholder version because not only can you do things with the Cartesian product, but I no longer need my temporary when I need to use something twice, which I think is, is awesome. Um, other things to comment on here is that uh, you'll note that I replaced the partial sum 
with a scan left. My guess is that we're not going to end up calling uh, uh, whatever scan we get in uh, the ranges library uh, partial sum. We're probably going to mimic what we did with fold left, fold left first, et cetera. Um, and then the, the other things you'll notice is there's an underscore phi and an underscore b. These are basically composition lambdas. Um, if you want, check it out. I have a GitHub repo called Blackbird. There's only a few of them implemented. But you'll note that if you ignore the phi, it reads equal less than or equal greater than. Like, that's basically English, minus the fact that this is called the phi combinator. You know, should we actually call them what they're known from combinatorial logic? Maybe not. Um, but also, too, the B combinator that's with the filter, that's just what people think of as function composition. It's two unary functions put together. But the truth is, is that like, that is a very, very simplistic view of composition. Function composition can be composing unary functions, binary functions, all different types of patterns. And that's what combinatory logic is all about, identifying these patterns and pointing out these show up all over the place. And the way that we deal with this is just by nesting things in parentheses all the times, which we've learned how to read. But is it the best way to read? I'm not sure. Um, I prefer the other one. But anyways, this, is, this code does not work. Um, I, what's up? Is the idea that the get is supposed to be like a forgetting from a placeholder? Uh, so this is just a shorter way to write std colon colon get. Um, I'm not even sure if this would work. I just was like, well, I'm in the midst of writing this fake code that doesn't work and putting the, the uh, b combinator and phi combinator in. I might as well shorten this uh, get as well because it's, like I said, I, I mentioned before you, you got in that if we had, uh, you know, polymorphic um, lambdas with uh, destructuring, like right now we don't even need the lambda, but like that's an alternative. But it's just, it, when you come from a functional language like Haskell and you want to, access the first element of a pair, you go map first, which is FST, or map second, SND. And it's just, it's such a, it's such a fundamental thing that we're doing. And the way that we spell it is with using std get colon colon, indis, like mentioning the index, and just irritates me. Um, but yeah, that's, hopefully we'll get something nicer. I mean, abbreviated uh, lambdas might be coming thanks to contracts in a future C++. You know, it was proposed earlier, and, uh, and then it was shot down, but now because contracts is coming and they have a use for it, it might show up. What's up? Uh, with the pipeline operator, technically, could you replace all of the pipe operator with the pipeline operator for ranges? Yes, yes, you could. And the only reason I left it out was ideally to uh, highlight where I really needed them. But um, you might start seeing basically code that it might become best practice or idiomatic to always just rely on the pipeline. Oh, sorry, so the question was, um, could you replace uh, the use of the pipe operator with the pipeline operator for uh, ranges? And the answer is definitely yes. That might become what's idiomatic um, because it does look a little weird. Like, you know, beginners are going to say, well, why am I using it here and not there? Uh, the main reason I did it was to highlight where I needed it. Um, the only difference would be if you added replaces with pipeline operators, as you'll see, is wherever I use the pipe operator, I don't have to. Uh, specify the placeholder. So it's, it's implicit as the first parameter. But yeah, that's a great question. Um, the last thing I want to say is uh, I've just, I was thinking about this the other day. It irritates me. Not is a keyword. And we also have std colon colon logical not. Like in APL, not is just a function. And like. Why did we decide that not, and I guess not was a, initially was the exclamation mark. Um, I, don't, I don't know, it just like, not is such a fundamental thing, but like we use it as a keyword and we don't use parentheses with it. Like we just, it just seems like a, an odd thing. I guess, I don't know, it comes from C. But um, it just weird, it's weird to me, I was thinking about this, that we have both not. We had a keyword and some kind of opportunity to make that passable as you know, something that was invocable or a function, but instead we end up with this template function, um, logical not. Like, also too, like, is there a non-logical not? <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I, I guess it just when you come from these. Why not? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah. I mean, I mean, but that's a pretty so. It, there was a comment from Bryce saying that we couldn't call it not because it's a keyword. Well, yeah, that makes total sense. But so then we added a whole set, what is that, seven character plus an underscore? I don't know. This, these fundamental things, like, you know, we get plus as a binary infix operation with a single character in C++. Same for minus, same for times, uh, same for divides. And then, and then we stopped there because that's where math stops. We didn't do min or max. And, and it's just we accept these things as, like, fact. And 
every once in a while when I start exploring these other languages, I start to think, well, why, why did we do it this way? Like, we could have done it differently. Like, there's no hope now, but it's just, I don't know. I find it interesting uh, to think about these kinds of things. Um, anyways, let's keep moving, because we've got two more sections, and we might actually get to the Harry Potter clips. Uh, so, outer product, uh, this is the um, last sort of programming problem that we're going to look at, and this might be not the best example. I think the, the not equals scan is, uh, you know, that's going to be a little bit irritating, but the not equal scan is a, a super, super intriguing, you know, thought experiment, if you can really wrap your mind around what that's doing. This is not as good, but the first time I learned outer product, my first thought was, oh my goodness, I can solve that problem that I solved on, solved on Code Forces a couple weeks ago so much nicer if I had something like that. So outer product, um, here is the Google Translate. This doesn't actually show up in many languages. Um, Haskell, I think, is really the only one that has it. Um, I guess Clojure does as well, but Core Matrix is not actually, uh, uh, I, I, it comes in a library, so it's there. Um, note that J and BQN call this table, um, and you'll see why in a second. R, R definitely has this. I think Julia, I, like, because I, Julia is sort of a, an evolved array language, has the ability to do an outer product, but it does it with sort of a language facility called broadcasting, so you don't actually need to, to call anything um, per se. Uh, but that's why if you're watching this and thinking, you know, Julia has, you can do this in Julia, but it, I couldn't really find a name for it, which is why it's not up there. Um, Small digression, we'll go through this very quickly. Uh, in my most recent book that we were covering on my meetup, um, we took a look at my top five favorite languages, and I noticed while I was looking at uh, this list that there's something uh, very interesting. Clojure, APL, Haskell, BQN. If you look at my top favorite languages, that's the first four. Like, oh, maybe it's just I like languages that have other products, so I don't know. And very curiously, I've been sort of alluding to my future talk, Composition Intuition. Um, if you're wondering, you know, why are those languages my favorite, um, this is a list. You can find it also in the GitHub repository that has all the content that sort of lists out, and this is the updated version because there was a couple mistakes um, in terms of the naming. I used to call the, the Phi Combinator the S Prime Combinator because that was David Turner's name for it, but he just re some, renamed something that already existed. Doesn't matter. Anyways, this is the updated good one. And the, you don't need to read this. The important part is that uh, the middle column here is BQN, and it has the richest support for combinators from combinatorial logic. Um, and you can see even too, APL, BQN, and Haskell, three of my top five favorite, lang favorite languages, have pretty good support for a lot of these combinators. And, like I said, stay tuned for my next talk that I give in the future. Um, end digression, back to outer product. So when you want to combine two sequences in C++, what algorithm do you reach for? Anyone? Tra transform. Yeah, that's a good point. There's multiple ones. But transform is the basic one if you're just doing a, a binary operation. Outer product also takes two sequences and a binary operation. But instead of just generating one sequence of the same length, it generates you a table. So for every combination, it's going to do something. So if you want to add these numbers together, that's what it gives you. This is basically, if you're familiar with Cartesian product, where it combines you, it's a structured Cartesian product. So you can implement this, which is what we're about to do, by basically using Cartesian product and another view called chunk, which takes n elements at a time and then gives you sort of a range of ranges. Um, and this. Like, I mean, this was two years ago now when I first learned outer product because it's such a, a, a bread and butter operator that's used in APL. This it delighted me. I, did, I had no idea. I, did, I don't think I knew about Cartesian product at the time, and I, I definitely didn't know about outer product. And when I realized you could do this, I was like, oh my, it's so wonderful. Like, we don't have this category of algorithms in C++ yet. We're getting them in C++ 23, but we basically have, like, sequences that you know, transform to other sequences. We don't have things that, you know, actually we do, we do have one, split, uh, that can take, give you a sequence and it's basically an unfold. It's called an anamorph anamorphism. It's the opposite of something that uh, folds. It sort of increases. Um, so the problem that we're gonna solve using an outer product is uh, this snow walking robot, which I'm not gonna read this. You know, if you want to, you can pause the YouTube video for those that are watching this online. And, um, uh, Basically, the part of this problem that we're going to look at, we're not going to look at the full thing, is that you're given basically a string of L, U, D, and R, which anyone can guess what that stands for? Yep, left, up, down, and right. So this basically explains a path. So you can think of, you know, we got the uh, blue L's, green U's, uh, red and yellow D's and R's that correspond to those words. And you can think of this as left, left, up, up, 
left, left, down, right. And the, the problem is going to ask you to discover something about this path. But the part of this problem that we're going to look at is just counting the numbers of lefts, ups, downs, and rights, because that's essential in order to solving the problem. You need to know how many lefts, how many ups, how many downs, and how many rights. So my solution back in 2018 or 19 uh, was this. We're not going to look at the full thing, but what's important is the part where we count. And this is just this is how I did it. I'm not sure if this is bad, if this is good. Uh, but at the time, like, there was not really a good, other than writing a for loop that's got you know, four variables that you're incrementing, or you know, Bryce is smirking at me. Do you got a better solution than this? I mean, in, so that's equivalent to the for loop, but then you're going to have either four variables or a std array that's, you know, and you've got four different if statements that are checking. I mean, it's, not, it's nothing that you can just reach for and, you know, snap of the fingers, you're done. Std reviews is going to be, depending on how you format it, at least like three to six lines. And so this was just, it's a competitive programming competition. I'm just trying to do something fast, writing all those if statements. I can go copy paste, you know, UDLR, and then do this quickly, and I'm done. Um, so anyways, this is how I solved it at the time. Uh, let's look at how we'll solve this in, in APL. So we've got our string, whatever, randomly, and we're going to, we're going to do an outer products, that's the, the circle and then the dot with equals. And uh, what this is going to do is it's going to give us a matrix of ones and zeros. So the first row is everywhere that an L occurs. So there's a one that corresponds to an L. Second row is the R. Third is the U. Fourth is the D. A way to think about this is that if you replace the equals with a basically make pair binary operation. They call it catenate in APL. But it's basically just joining all two of these. And you can replace that catenate with any binary operation that you want. So in our case, we want to check, are they equal? If these were numbers, you could plus, you could times, or we saw plus earlier uh, for the addition table. And so uh, you once again, you think in my brain visually, you take these two sequences that no, don't have to be the same length, and then you just go whoop, create a table, and you apply the binary operation. And this is just, it's change the way that I thought about this kind of problem. And what do you do now when you have this matrix of one and zeros? All you have to do is sum up each of the rows. And because in APL, your operations are rank polymorphic, they're defined for numbers, sequences, matrices. That's all I have to do. Note that there's no mapping here. The mapping is implicit. So I just add this plus reduce, and it gives me 4, 4, 3, 3, and I'm done. That's it. One outer product equals and one sum. So how do we do this in C++? Once again, not saying that this is the way you would want to solve this in C++. It just it affects the way that I could solve this in C++. So first, let's implement an outer product. Like I said, you can do this with a Cartesian product and then piping it to a, a views transform, which we need to do in order to apply our binary operation to our sequence of elements. And note that for this outer product, we're doing it for a range of two. But you could design these that could work on technically more than two ranges, because std apply just applies whatever operation you have to your tuple or your tuple-like thing of elements. And then once you have this, you just have to chunk it to uh, uh, pipe it to a chunk, which basically takes n elements at a time. So you specify the n, which is just the distance of right, and you're done. Which is I like this of the C++ code admittedly of which, you know, it's probably only 10 or 15% of my talk. Um, this might be my favorite C++ slide. Also, too, because you get to use the unconstrained uh, auto for C++ 20 concepts, which not recommending you do this, but for slideware, it's absolutely fantastic. And also for playing around in Godbolt when you don't want to deal with all the template stuff, you just go right ahead and you're done. Um, so now that we've got outer product, we can solve the problem like this, or at least the first part, where we're just counting up the L's, the U's, uh, the R's, and the D's. You call outer product with a string view, stood equal to, once again, more verbose than the equal we get in APL. And then we just pipe this to a transform. Note that because in C++, we don't have rank polymorphism. We don't define our uh, algorithms you know, to work on integer sequences and, and you know, higher dimensional arrays. Um, so we have to use our mapping algorithm, aka transform, and then calling our reduction. And I actually, even though the bottom line is very verbose, the fold left first uh, dot value, I actually I like it quite a bit, um, even though it's more verbose. And note that technically, What's happening, this is a closer translation to uh, what we are doing in APL, because um, the outer product is an operator that takes only one input, and that's a binary operation. And then that returns you a function that takes two sequences. So this, you can see now, outer product just takes a binary operation, and then it returns you a lambda that captures the binary operation, and then that lambda that's returned, or closure object, if you will, uh, is returning you know, a thing that can be called uh, with two arguments. And then the only difference down here is that instead of passing three arguments to outer product, you pass 
the one binary operation, which now comes first, that returns you a closure object, which then will take two arguments, so you need an extra set of parentheses. Am I, what's up? Um, maybe, maybe. I mean, it really, when I, because I initially, when I started learning about the operators, I didn't, I didn't realize that that's the way they worked. When I wrote an outer, outer product, I would always just binary operation, two sequences. I didn't realize that what was really happening was, was this, is that the operator takes a binary operation and returns you a new function. Um, and should it be done like this? I'm not sure. I just, like, I think it's important to kind of think about these things that, um, you know, it, you result, and there are there are many talks that have been given, um, especially in JavaScript, that show sort of how to implement the SKI combinatory logic, and you end up with these parentheses, parentheses, and it's a chain of parentheses calls where you're just passing in one thing at a time because you're effectively currying at that point. But so I'm not saying that like that's how C++ should be done, but like this is closer in spirit to what APL is doing here. Um, and just to uh, highlight some different solutions, we got to go through this quick. But Python. Um, has a, a data structure or a container called counter. And this is really the, what you want. Um, so I'm showing you an APL to C++, but like, learn all the languages. Learn all, like, APL exploded the different tools that I had for solving things, but at times I'm thinking, oh, there's that thing in Haskell, or there's that thing in Python. The counter collection is perfect for this. It basically creates you a hash map and counts everything automatically. Um, it's like a group by, if you're familiar with that, from SQL or other languages, and then you've got a values method. Uh, you have to convert it to a list. Um, speaking of Haskell, this is the APL solution. Note that uh, your outer product, equal, equal for equals, um, here, we're getting back trues and falses. And because of the strong typing, uh, and there's no type coercion really in Haskell, you've got to convert your trues and falses to something that's summable. You can't add up trues and falses like you can. I'm not sure if anyone picked up on that, but that's actually what I was doing in the C++ solution. I was, I was adding up trues and falses because we have uh, you know, co type coercion, which you know, I'm sure there's someone on YouTube that's going to point out, I can't believe he did that. You know, I've, I've got those comps before. But you know, it's, uh, it's Slideware. So there's actually a, a different C++ or a Haskell solution, which is using count. Count is the equivalent of counter from Python. So I would argue that this is actually, this is a much better solution than the outer product one. There are times in Haskell when you want to reach for outer product, but for this specific problem, this is much easier to read as long as you know what count does. Is it a good name? I'd argue no, but say what you will. Um, so these are all sort of four of them next to each other. Uh, and, and that's sort of the idea is, is explore different ways to solve things in different languages. It'll, it'll affect the way that you write C++ code at the end of the day. And just juxtaposing these two, you can see that they really are the same solution. Those are the equals. Those are the outer product. That's the LRUD. That's the reduction. And that's the binary operation. Note there's a couple extra things in C++. Like I said, we don't have rank polymorphism that APL has, so we need to be explicit about our mapping. And especially when it comes to higher dimensional things, it's very irritating. You saw the two maps in Haskell, it's irritating. If you're working on a rank three array, you have to go transform, transform, transform. And that's why exploring array languages because you end up building libraries that basically implicitly have that sort of rank polymorphism built into their algorithms. Um, I think that is the last thing I have to say. It's actually not. Because I just made that point. What if you wrote a library where you had a rank polymorphic fold left first? You know, it's, it's something we could do. Uh, if you were interested in learning more about Outer Product, um, there's a fantastic, it's not even a talk, it's like a workshop that was given by Marshall Lockbaum, the creator of BQN. This link will also be at the end of the slides. Um, he gave this at LambdaConf a few years ago. It's a fantastic talk because he shows a ton of different ways that you can use Outer Product. Um, last but not least, we have a few minutes, and I'm, if we want, we can. It's going to be brutal. Um, <laughs> uh, rotate. So um, we're going to come back to this. But um, you uh, might have noticed that at the bottom of this uh, slides, it shows rotate and reverse. <laughs> and um, you might notice that they are the same symbol. So I haven't mentioned this, because this is not an APL sort of uh, lecture. but. Um, in APL, they overload the uh, operators or the functions. So everything has two meetings. Um, and so when a, a reverse glyph is called monadically, or you know, with one argument, you're reversing. Uh, but when it's called with two glyphs, you're rotating. And um, you might think, like, is this, is this a good like reverse? You can see that if you basically reverse the glyph, it's the same thing. But <laughs> rotate, uh, it's a bit of a stretch. Does anybody know the relationship between reverse and rotate? Yeah, Richard, Richard's pointing out exactly what I've been doing. It's uh, the Doug McElroy hand algorithm. Hand waving is what he calls it. 
Um, you can implement rotate with three reverses. It's not just the visual symmetry, it's the semantic relationships in the glyphs. Ken Iverson put so much thought into the overloading of, and I'm not saying that the overloading is a good thing. It might be that the best APL or array language didn't overload on the meeting of their glyphs and they just had twice as many glyphs or symbols. But there's so much thought and care was put into the relationship between these two. And I didn't, I actually didn't know this and I forgot about it and I rediscovered it while implementing, trying to implement a rotate in APL using APL. Um, note that this is technically a ill-formed implementation because it's returning void, you should return an iterator. Um, but what's cool about this is I was like, you know, this is, it's beautiful. It's probably the way standard libraries do it. This is Microsoft STLs now on GitHub. Applause to Microsoft for putting, uh, open sourcing their uh, STL implementation. This is pretty noisy, a lot of blah, blah, blah. But if you zoom in, you can see. It's exactly what they're doing. And, and once again, other folks maybe learn this from reading a book or something else. Um, I learned it once from a book, forgot, and then relearned it when I was, you know, playing around with APL and noticed that, like, what's the reason? Trying to think about, you know, what, why did Ken Iverson choose, you know, to overload reverse with uh, rotate? And the thing that Richard pointed out, um, this is the Doug McElroy's hand-waving algorithm that basically, I mean, I'm not being recorded right now, but for people in the room, you take your two hands, you basically flip, you know, you're given three iterators. So you flip, you reverse, uh, up to from the first to the middle, then the middle to the end, and then you do the whole thing, and then you end up with a rotated up, uh, sequence. Like just if that was too fast, try it yourself, and you'll realize that that's that's actually what's happening. Um, and this comes from uh, that little diagram comes from Programming Pearls, which is a fantastic book that talks a ton about algorithms and a ton about other stuff. A um, couple minutes left, I might go a tiny bit over it. That's all right. Well, unless if people want to skip the Harry Potter sequence. No, keep going. Um, <laughs> but um, so I'm not going to go through this in detail, but. Um, that's reverse and rotate on the left, but transposes in the middle. It's, it it's showing you the axis that you rotate a matrix on. And the last one is called a reverse first. Technically, is, it's similar to the first one, but when you're working on a matrix, it just, instead of doing it vertically, it does it horizontally. I used these for like half a year before I read in a, a paper that like, oh, these, it's obvious what these do because it visually represents it. I had not even noticed it. And I was just like, holy smoke, how did I use these and not recognize that it's, it's telling you what it does? And so many algorithms are like that. This is a take and drop. And note that like, once again, in functional language, what does take have to do with drop? In the, in, the, in the name, there's nothing there to show that those are the same things. You have to know the semantics of what take means and drop means. You can see that these are related just because of their, their horizontally symmetric. Um, min and max, I, I whined earlier about binary operations, stopping at you know, plus, minus, times, and divides. Ken Iverson saw that and was like, well, why? Min and max are just as important. And he, he created binary infix operations for this. And some mathematic notations actually pick this up. Um, logical and and not, I've talked about that already. All of the equality operators. It irritates me now in C. I mean, we can't, we can't do better in C++, but like equals is one, um, and then not equals is another, and less than or equal to or equal to. Some of them are one, some of them are two. In APL, it's just nice. They're all, they're all one. It's, it's all, and the symmetry is there. When you look at a not equals, depending on the language, they, they choose, there's not even any consistency. Some of them is exclamation equals. Some of them is slash equals. Some of them is, you know, I think basic is like less than equal than. To, like, depending on the language, we all just created a different binary infix operation for not equal to. Um, when we have, we have a symbol. We, we have, like, it's in our keyboard that we get equal, but we didn't put not equal to. It, anyways, it's just, this stuff gets me worked up. And then uh, the last one, power and log. It's beautiful. And Roger Huey, the implementer of J, has an article where he talks about how uh, the log operator, it's his favorite primitive, his favorite symbol, because there's no log operator anywhere. We always just spell log as a prefix function. And also, too, the fact that in APL the uh, star is exponent, it, it once again shows that there's a relationship. One's an exponent, one's log. Um, anyways, this is the last section of my talk, which was going to be in a different version if I gave this two years ago, the start of the talk. Um, because you might be thinking, why did I use the Harry Potter you know, symbols? I sort of did the same thing in my first algorithm intuition. I used Scrabble glyphs. So I have zero minutes left. So yes, we're going to go over by about five minutes to just watch a couple clips and have some fun. So let's go to uh, the very first Harry Potter <laughs> and watch a clip. We might need to turn the volume a, a little bit up. I wonder. Yeah. 
So there's multiple things going on in the scene that I'm going to talk about. But we have to watch another clip because this wand has a brother. It is curious that you should be destined for this wand when its brother gave you that scar. So if you've read the Harry Potter books or watched the movies, you'll know that it's in the Goblet of Fire that the brother wand shows up. So let's watch a clip from that movie. Anybody see what I see? <laughs> Look at that. Perfect. Perfect. Secretly, Voldemort and Harry Potter's wands are the scan and reduce algorithms. Um, anyways, in summary, uh, like I said, this talk wasn't about convincing you to try and learn APL. This talk was about trying to convince you, as Mr. Ollivander said, be curious. Try to learn to think different by learning different languages. And as Kate mentioned, always be learning. Or she said, make learning fun. But learning for me is it's, it's intoxicating. Like, like I said, when I, when I watched that Stepanov talk and then he said that Accumulate came straight from APL, I, I literally, like, almost fell out of my chair. I was like, oh my God, this is going to be perfect for the talk. Like, it's, I don't know, so exciting for me. And, and learning about outer product, these things just get me so excited. Um, and there's another quote that I want to mention. Um, you can never understand one language until you understand at least two. He's speaking about spoken languages. Um, but I think this can be applied to programming languages. And I, I don't want to say that you can never understand. But what the point he's trying to make is that you gain a greater appreciation for what is in your language and what is not in your language by studying other programming languages. Um, the ones that are sort of circled around here, um, like I said, try to learn languages in different paradigms. The ones that are in the left column, they're all sort of the same derivative of C from a long time ago or Algol, you know, whereas APL, Lisps, Haskells, they're in different paradigms. There's more than just these paradigms, you know. There's uh, Elixir and um, Erlang on the beam. There's other array languages. There's functional languages. There's uh, Smalltalk and um, also Prolog is the little L on the end. So if you're going to learn a different language, learn a language that you don't operate, you know, your language, you know, we're all at C++ devs. Try and choose one from this. I'm not saying APL. APL is, is the best one to learn. Choose any one of these. Or choose, you know, there's, I think, a quote from, uh, I can't remember the book, but it's, you know, learn a different language every year is that kind of thing. Not super in-depth, but um, I can't advocate for this enough. Anyways, uh, if you do want to go down the rabbit hole, these are some very, very inspiring, influential papers and videos that um, I, I talked, or either have given or read, basically. There's one by me. Um, also, too, I've mentioned that uh, I host the ArrayCast podcast, where we have you know, folks from the industry and discussions about Array languages. Um, like I mentioned before, all of the links for any podcasts, videos, things I quoted can be found on the GitHub repo under um, content or the link at the bottom. Um, and with that, I'm five minutes over. Thank you. And uh, I'm not sure if we have time for questions because we're over, but I'm happy to take any, but I know we've got a keynote to get to in 25 minutes, so. All right, if people want to ask questions, feel free to find me in the hallway. We can talk about this stuff later. Thank you so much.